Howdy. Howdy. <laughs> Folks, there must be some confusion here because such a classy sound engineer, tone box tinker, and music maker is here with me today. He is the co-founder, founder or co-founder? Uh, co-founder in a he, way. He is the co-founder in a way of, <laughs> of Jack Stelez <laughs> and the purveyor of Rust Belt Studios. Yeah. Please welcome Mr. Bob Ebling. How you doing, sir? Hello. Good hello. to see you. I'm afraid I put mystery on the spot. Kind of reminds me of the mystery spot in Michigan. Yeah. <laughs> but he will do his best, his level best, to justify his aforementioned ability. Yep. Oh, it just makes me so emotional. No, it's actually, I haven't got it right now. Well, Bob, I suppose you know why we are here today, besides to get dripped on by uh, drips. Mm-hmm. And, I, and I, I know it because you chose the location. Yeah. Johnny Carson called Don Rickles the Merchant of Venom, a Shakespearean take. So I will deign to call Bob Ebeling the Gerent of Germanium. I love language. The word gerent means to manage or to lead, which Bob is the leader of New Old Stock Germanium put to its best use. But I also have a love for the Latin origin of the word, which is to bear or to carry on. And I think Bob Ebeling and Jextelez are carrying on the intent and legacy of the Stradivarius of New Old Stock Germanium and so on. I can think of three reasons, and let me tell you, and, and, and tell me if you can think of more, why I would buy a Jextelez vintage pedal over the pedal it derives its inspiration from. One, you perfected the ideal of the original. Two, uh, which in two ways, you knew the schematics of the original, their, the, you know, their public uh, information. Took but more apart. importantly, you vociferously studied the real thing and sought a perfect match as a starting point before sometimes adding additional layers of sonic control. Two, you added to the original, I just said. And then three, modern housing and construction might last longer or at least will start rusting 50 years later <laughs> than the 50-year-old originals. So I would rather buy a Jex Telez Dizzy Tone than an Elka Dizzy Tone because you use the ideal versions of the original parts in their ideal settings, placing them inside of modern housings. So uh, is germanium like a light bulb inevitably doomed to burn out? Or is it more like an LED that seems to last forever and ever? Uh, do you think the pedal housings used today are better or worse than the ones used in the pedals you're inspired by? Um... The germanium, people say they, they will wear out, but I haven't really can't come across that. Um, they seem to go on and on and on, and hopefully that's the case. That, so it's, it's not like a light bulb that burns out after so much time? No, I don't think so. I mean, they, they do occasionally go, go bad, So, um, but that's like one in every hundred. If you got bad luck or if you ran some power that it doesn't like into it. I was gonna say if you're gonna if you're about to give the opposite answer, I would have replied with, "I don't understand. These machines have always performed with optimum efficiency. <laughs> have similar problems arisen in other OVAs <laughs> from us from Fantastic Planet, but no one can ascertain that there were considerable damage and chaos wreaked by the ohms in the OVAs of Jext and Teles. I like That's how right. he, I like how he says Jext and Teles. Like he kind of like he's, he's kind of happy about it, even though it's like talking about damage, you know, bad news." I don't understand. These machines have always performed with optimum efficiency. Have similar problems arisen in other OVAs? No. No? No. 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 Of course, if the animal evolves, we've not yet ascertained that fact. But no, one can ascertain that there was considerable damage and chaos wreaked by the ohms in the OVAs of Jex and Teles. Uh, uh, speaking of Fantastic Planet, 1973, it reminds me of the passage in Proverbs, you know, because all the little people, uh, it's, it's either from Proverbs or like uh, Gulliver's Travels by Jonathan Swift, the, the Lilliputians, like, you know, like the mini, miniature people. Uh, uh, Proverbs 6, uh, chapter 6, uh, go to the ant, thou sluggard, consider her ways and be wise, which having no guide, overseer, or ruler, provideth her meat in the summer and gathereth her food in the harvest. You know, like because they talked about the the good work work ethic of the ohms mm. uh, of of the people. Mm. But uh, I, I watched that movie for the first time, folks. <laughs> here, here's the the movie, and, and check the description. There'll be a link to it in the description below. Watch it for yourself and learn the origin of uh, of Jex Telez. Now, uh, sticking to Fantastic Planet, we'll, we'll make today like this little spot about Fantastic Planet. Sure. 
Uh, you have the, the a studio people can only dream of, every, every toy gizmo gadget. Do you own, this has nothing to do with music, but I suppose with you, do you own any, any cells from the original movie? No. C- uh, cells from... You know, like like individual frames that were used to make the animations? Oh, I, don't, no. I don't know if they're even available or not, or if they survived all these years, but... There, that... there was a set of dolls out, like uh, action figures, a, <laughs> a while back, and I almost started buying those, but I'm not very much of an action figure story guy ever since star wars i was an action figure kid when i was six i wanted all those star wars ones but my mom wouldn't really fall into that for me well there goes that great investment yeah i, mean, I guess maybe you would have uh, <laughs> taken them out like ants and uh you know with a magnifying glass but <laughs> or or there's a uh, there's this channel on youtube called red letter media and they took a bunch of old star wars toys and melted them in acetone just to like prove that like stop caring about my uh, friend and I went out to the woods and burned a bunch of Star Wars stuff, and that was really toxic. Oh, man. It was like black smoke, and it just it, it's it was bad. bad. <laughs> yeah, I can, I can imagine. <laughs> uh, so uh, the movie Fantastic Planet has a uh, very, it's 1973, very 1973. Uh, yeah, soundtrack's uh, awesome. Could that be a Vox Fuzzwa or just like some sort of Fuzzwa? Going on or that was early or in the pedal. in the wah pedal era because they were actually making that since like '69, so that was probably right at the at the top of the. It was probably is a Vox. Man, uh, and then one last question: We're gonna change locations. Mm-hmm. Do you think? Because uh, listen to the soundtrack is is um, actually two questions about it. I, I have a, actually I can think of a bunch, but we'll just do two more. Listening to the soundtrack, um, uh, do you think that your studio could? recreate that soundtrack to like the same quality or even better oh man um i would need uh analog and a big band because that stuff's oh. all cut live oh wow and and onto analog tape because that's all they had back then that's a pretty impressive soundtrack yeah the sound of that i mean that's really why i watch that movie all the time is, is the the soundtrack of it well also it's it's so unusually presented like uh like the chapters like how it like starts and stops like the the structure of the storyline that i think it it, it rewards or, or allows rewatching because you can always pick up more details out of it oh big time and then one last question on fantastic planet we'll switch locations at the very end of the movie just like at the very end of fairytale is that the album fairytale blues mm-hmm. the newest one mm-hmm. i just listened to it yesterday the very end of the album i hear bird sounds just like i hear in the end of the movie were there any inspiration from that it just happened to be uh just happened to be that i got um crazy on uh recording out here in this woods and all around this area just capturing birds and yeah. wind noises and and then adding it to mixes like i had finished mixes and figuring out mastering is always like uh it's like the black art of audio (laughs) so so i was actually just i would come out here record just trees gusting in the wind and a few birds and then i would add that back to my mix that was already finished and then see how loud can i turn it up can i turn it down to a certain point where you don't hear it but it does something to the audio and i started mm-hmm. to find that yeah you can really mess with uh, a, a mix by just adding a little tiny bit of noise underneath it mm-hmm. and i spent probably a year c- exploring that man yeah um uh, it, it, one more thing we'll, we'll, uh, it, it, can you cancel out sounds by adding or taking away sounds or add you know almost yeah. like change like what was it the the mamas what the mamas and the papas four people but they joked there was a fifth singer because the way they'd harmonize it would create the illusion of a fifth vocalist oh yeah yeah uh, almost like the, 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 the black magic yeah. how, how does that work but there it is yeah my own voice like i always stack it and when i stack it singing at my regular voice not in falsetto after three or four you'll end up hearing a falsetto and it re- like really sounds like there's a falsetto there but it's it's like the upper part of my range is doubling and tripling up, and then they start to stand on top of each other. It starts to strengthen it if you're doing it right. And so, yeah, there's so many unexplored avenues in audio 
where you can like if you have a noisy mix and there's like some kind of 60 cycle hum or any kind of hissy noise that you're against like if you add a very similar noise to it and it happens to be out of phase with the one that's on the mix that you can make it disappear <laughs> so the, 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 to fix noise you add more noise says the says the purveyor of Jextiles, which uh, some people might uh, dysphemically call Fuzzbox's noise machines, but um, but yet they can add so much, or, or yeah, they can change the sound of your sound. Yeah, man. All right, well, thank you very much. We'll we'll move to a different location. We'll catch you in the next one. Fifteen millimeter and uh, <laughs> five hundred millimeter, all in the same shot. One, two, three, snap. Two, two, three, snap, snap. All right, help myself out later. Ladies and gentlemen, we have with us one of the world's outstanding pedal producers. Out of the woods. <laughs> out of the woods and here for you to see on display. Most of us know him as a mild-mannered sound engineer with a golden ear. Actually, that is what he is, even if you didn't know him yet. And he is so much more. Please welcome Mr. Bob Evelyn. How you doing? We're back. <laughs> we're and we're back. back. <laughs> Sorry, I, I write down random lines with wisdom distilled by the jungle Indians in the upper reaches of the Amazon. It's from the 1930s uh, whodunit film. All right. I just thought that was a weird line. Okay. That's a good one. What would you say offhand? Complete and instantaneous paralysis of the respiratory organs with possible brain hemorrhage. Might be the work of some poison, Graham. Do you know the poison that would work this? Yes, just one. In civilized countries, it's known only to a few chemists and scientists. It's distilled by jungle Indians from the upper reaches of the Amazon. You decided to become a musician at age six. Yes. What outside or inside force compelled your young self towards seeking a life in music? What is the hardest instrument that you've never played? Kind of sounds like Adam Egott, you know, Bruce Jenner. What's the hardest sport you never tried? Well, I don't know. I never tried it. <laughs> What's the hardest? <laughs> <laughs> What's the hardest instrument you haven't played yet? No. Bassoon. The bassoon, okay. Bassoon enough, you will play it. Actually, have a year. <laughs> under your seat. <laughs> it's a pretty big seat to fit a bassoon. You started four tracking at the age of 21. Was your earliest recording work ever for... Uh, was your earliest recording, recording work ever for other people only? Or for other people or only for yourself? Like when you first started recording. Mm. Um... What, what was it hard for to record? Um, okay, let me let me rephrase Sorry, that. Sorry, I gotta speed no, the brain up here. No, that's fine. No, I, I gotta uh, clear up my my sentences. So when you first started recording, two questions: Did you yeah. record for yourself or for others? And the second question is: Yeah, yeah. Um, when you first got to the studio, because you started recording at home, mm -hmm. did you have like a rush of confidence that maybe others might not have? That like you came with so much more experience than than most. No. Um, well. <laughs> I might have been a little cocky in general, but that was maybe just covering up, like, uh, not knowing. But, no, I never felt in unconfident, inconfident, un deconfident. Like, I, I imagine uh, the show of shows with um, uh, Sid Caesar and all those legends, like um, uh, uh, Woody Allen, uh, um, uh, what's that guy's name? His son's name is Max. But his son's not as famous as him. Bru uh, he, he directed um, Young Frankenstein. He directed um, Mel Brooks. Mm -hmm. Mel Brooks, Carl Reiner, are like this like legendary cast of writers mm -hmm. that all, you know, Neil Simon, you know, the Simon brothers. But all these legends, Mel Brooks kind of walked in, kind of strutted around. He was so confident mm -hmm. right off the bat. Mm -hmm. so yeah, I became that. You became sure. confident. Yeah. Uh, how long, like how many years, did, did it take a number of years to grow into that? Or Yeah, um, took a number of, of recording. Probably didn't take very much because I, I guess I was kind of, like I said, kind of cocky. But um, I, I don't know. I just, it just is who I was at that time. Like I, I uh, let, let's kind of cross uh, disciplines here. I'm, uh, discipline, disciplines here. I'm a photographer, videographer. 
I have trouble getting jobs, getting people that, because I, I want to do everything for free, because I'm kind of like a giving person. Like, I, I just, I have so much on my mind, so much I want to, like, put out there in the world. I'm like, okay, let's do it, you know? But, like, how, how did you learn to monetize your, your skill? Um, when did that come along? That was when we, um, well, the first thing I did was I bought a Tascam 16-track half-inch recorder and a, and a board that went with it and that was like eight thousand dollars on a credit card Woo! and that will start to motivate you <laughs> a little bit so really it's getting in debt that motivated me that okay so um 97 98 99 started in 97 built through 98 at the beginning of 99 rust yeah, belt studios yeah. what was it uh uh, uh uh, fourteen thousand. Well, it was no. twenty five thousand all together. And you to used start Rust Belt. But you used fourteen thousand of that on wood and drywall. Yeah, you, or I think fourteen thousand was for the board that wow. we bought from England, which we had to get delivered to Detroit Metro Airport and go and pick up in a huge rental truck. And then maybe the other eleven thousand was it went into the walls and drywall and more went into the board than the. Than everything else. Yeah, yeah. You, you treat it like a, like a 1970s couch, you know, put plastic over it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no one dumps their coffee. We had some bad couches for a long time. No, I mean, did you did you treat it like a 70s couch and put plastic over it? You know, like no one can jump dump their coffee. Oh yeah, $15, while we were dollars. while we were working for sure. Yeah. Oh man. We were still building walls around it. You still have? Do you still use that? Is that your main board to this day? No, that board um, got sold off by Al. At Al Sutton. Some, yeah, at some point when he replaced it with a Neve, and then he replaced the Neve with an API, and he still has the API. And are these kind of steps up that you guys, you know, we, you consider them upgrades to the years? Yeah, for sure. Oh, wonderful. For so sure. um, interesting that you, you, you sought uh, an international source for, you know, that must have cost more money than, you know, getting it uh, locally. Well, it was a CalRec board made by the BBC, so it was like wow. it was in the Neve. Um, neighborhood of quality, but it wasn't Neve money because the Neve at that time was like eighty grand. So this was fourteen. You said earlier uh, the, the the irony of of people taking forever to buy something inexpensive and not taking much time to buy something really expensive. Uh, mm -hmm. How how long was the selection process of of picking up of picking that board out? Um. All I remember is we need we knew we needed a console and Al had some connections in England and we saw that one and it was 14 grand hmm. and it fit our budget and it looked pretty cool. <laughs> it was pretty cool. It was like uh, 28 channels Man. and it had eight compressors built in. So it fit the bill for us. One last question because we're, we're spending a lot of time on this, but I, I do want to hear your life story because it can come maybe one day patch us together or something, you know, mm -hmm. we got a little bit last time, a little bit this time. Sure. Um, uh, back to the England thing, uh, so many uh, English-inspired effects you guys put out. You know, even before you started Juxtas, when you started your studio, before you, that was a, a, a thought in your mind's eye. Oh, glimmer. still to this day, it's British equipment. Um, Quite a bit. Not, not German, not any other? German too, but the German stuff's more the Telefunken and Siemens, and that's that was like a phase, We for sure, we, we had... Uh, four v76 telefunken v76 preamps and uh but still yeah german with the mics is neumann german neumann's yeah. german akg is from austria and so yeah still it's all uh austrian and german mics from the late 50s and early 60s uh, uh austrian german mics british boards and effects and british and, and amps. preamps yeah american what american uh dynamic mics um reverbs lexicon reverbs from the late 70s and early 80s those are american and just curious curious me any other countries uh that that are, uh, make anything of note that the audio world uh top top shelf audio world not uses? really not i mean japan made a lot of stuff and they do have a couple good mics the sony c37a is is great great mic but for the most part, it's uh, German, Austrian, British, American. You know, it's so funny. <laughs> Dated reference. I shouldn't make it. But if we were to go into WW3, it sounds like 
one side would be the side with all the best music gear, <laughs> <laughs> and the other side would just be the other side. <laughs> just another another way to look at geopolitics <laughs> through the eyes of it. I wonder about that sometimes. <laughs> when this next era of World War III kicks off, am I going to even be able to record? Am I going to be able to use all this stuff? What's that? The revolution will not be televised. <laughs> 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 it won't be recorded at all. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, Okay, so we already covered that. Oh, it's so silly. Uh, I don't want to don't want to wear the word is uh, litter. What's that? Leave only footprints, take only pictures. I'm thinking of pictures. How much time I got? Seven minutes. I, uh, I, you know, I I can't leave the the idea of of you at such a young age. Um, how do you call it? Um, having all that money. In, at your uh, disposal, this quote from an uh, English soccer player, George Best, looking back on his life. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> I spent a lot of money on booze, birds, and fast cars. The rest I just squandered. But uh, I, yeah, um, He was hanging out with the rock and rollers. Oh, he was? Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, birds for the people at home, that's, that's ladies. Right, birds, right. Uh, if they don't know. How did you handle the immense responsibility of all that money at such a young age? And, and what advice would you give yourself back then or someone in the present time attempting the same feat of starting an ambitious studio at a young age? It was that was what really motivated me to work and get other bands in, because when you owe 25 grand um, and it's like, you know, four or five hundred dollars a month that you have to pay on that. And um, I did not want to fail in that endeavor. So, yeah, we were out on the social scene around Detroit and just trying to drag bands in there, trying to get whatever we could out of a session, maybe 300 bucks a day. Man. And so, yeah, you would really work hard to get somebody to come in with 600 or 900 bucks and spend a long weekend or three or four days with you. Uh, given your, 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 your wisdom and experience uh, since then, would you would you tell yourself to change anything to have a better outcome? No, I mean, Interesting. <laughs> I mean, that was really what led me further along was getting the experience of doing it over and over, recording songs and albums, and then that led to um, a Grammy nomination with Eminem, and that led me to New York City, which was head engineer at another studio doing uh albums with uh i did an album with fish i did a couple albums with rufus wainwright um and a lot of records uh there's one really good one i did in new york with dead meadow and um i can't think of all the big credits but yeah that that, oh, that yeah. led everything you know working your your tail off to uh cover the money that you owe really is what led me into being an engineer more. You adored growing up studio bands. You are a studio master yourself. You have your own studio, a master full studio. Mm -hmm. a and, and you recorded these amazing, again, known for being studio bands, like Great Sound. Your, your album self-titled Bob Ebeling called Fairytale Blues, mm -hmm. wonderful sounding album. Um, and I was curious when I was listening to it, if if there were times in it that you did things you wish you could have done with other bands, like, okay, now's my chance, I'll do it myself then. Mm. Um, or, or, or if you did get to do them, like, I'm, I'm gonna do it again. Like, like certain directors, like uh, uh, Cecil B. DeMille shot, um, was it the, the Moses one? I forget what it's called, Ten Commandments? He shot that twice. He shot it as a silent film in the 20s and as like a talkie in the 40s or 50s. Yeah. And uh, if you watch both films, uh, it's almost shot for shot the same, a lot of the same locations, even some of the same props. But some shots are just a little bit different, and he did it on purpose. He's like, I already did it that way last time. I'm just going to do a little, a little skew. It'll work just the same. Like, maybe yeah. was that at play in, uh, in your music? Yeah. I mean, it relates to what we started in the woods talking about a little bit, where I was adding, like, birds and wind sounds into mixes. If I got to... Uh, a certain mix and it just wasn't performing on the it sounds like a finished record um, 
level, then I would start to experiment with what could I do to it to to get there. And yeah. I started to add just weird things and noises and noises and uh, wind and different things into mixes. And I would spend days and weeks just adding low level noise and just other songs just underneath other songs just to try to uh, get that effect that your ear wants to hear where it's like, okay, this sounds like a finished record. And a lot of times I came across bizarre solutions. Interesting. Like take a mix and then um, take a um, Bluetooth karaoke machine out to the silo that we were in and then uh, run the mix through the karaoke machine into the silo, set up a stereo mic and re-record just the ambience and then add that ambience back into the mix. And that really was the solution a lot of times for um, the indescribable quality that you're after. Yeah. Like I, I, I know nothing of sound engineering, but I, I just heard a, a, an hour long you know, Nirvana interview the other day that talked about Steve Albini. They put like plywood on the ground or something to like rattle as, you know, to give more, whatever you call it, sound, you know, more natural sound to the to the recording. Yeah, drums sound better when they're up, up on a ply, plywood riser sometimes. Hmm. Like because the kick drum's like rattling that riser not rattling it but it's uh what is it vibrating yeah yeah it's it's uh, resonating yeah this, this big piece of wood and that that has a certain sound to it yeah but, almost like an acoustic guitar like the sound box around really yeah it, the big the big hole the big <laughs> mm -hmm. the, the the torso of the guitar as it were mm -hmm. uh yeah i'm gonna be right back cause i gotta switch out or the time on the camera. okay <laughs> you mentioned before <laughs> Siblings. Hello, hello. You, 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 you mentioned before that you love Ringo's drum sound and Paul's bass sound. Is there any sound from John or George that you like? And I would have to guess that it would be the Vox Conqueror amp that you recreated in the white pedal. Uh, speaking of, what is the story of the creation of the white pedal? You said that you would not build a guitar amp and yet <laughs> your initial Jextilize offering was a pedal based on a guitar amp. Yeah. Was the very first Jextilize pedal the white pedal? And would you ever build a guitar amp based on a guitar pedal? Well, the first guitar pedal we did was the Dizzy Tone. Oh. In the big metal box version ones. Yeah. And um, that was like Al Sutton talked me into doing it. And that was really the launch of Jextilize was... Um, letting somebody else's idea happen, you know, because I w probably wouldn't have made guitar pedals without him already being kind of obsessed with manufacturing stuff. So he was a huge part of getting that started. Um, and then after the Dizzy Tone, well, I don't have to list every pedal, but um, the white pedal came in pretty early. Yeah. And um, there was... You know, in just being obsessed with Beatles tones, definitely John's, all the guitar sounds on the White Album hmm. have, like, even the bass tone, all have this really strange kind of pig grunting noise to it, especially the bass, like, on the track Piggies, like, the bass <laughs> really? guitar sounds like a pig kind of, but on the whole album it has a little bit of a pig, pig like grunt going on, and that... I come to find out was because they were using a bass six, a Fender bass six, which is a really low, different, odd sounding bass. And, um, but the other part of it was because they were using those, uh, Vox Conquerors and there was, there was like a hundred watt bass one version for, of the same solid state with germanium transistor fuzz built in. And, um, so yeah. And, just loving those sounds i was like i gotta hear this i got and reading up on it and then there was some other companies were making some versions of of the white pedal but not like the white pedal um there was one guy that just made he was called kr i think 
and he made something called the Conqueror, I think it was. And I think he only made about two of them. And I managed to get a hold of one, and it was like, oh, wow, this is awesome. There was another company in England, I think Castledine, and they made something called the Magical Mystery Box. So I got a hold of one of those, too. And, and it was good, but it wasn't as cool as the KR one. So basically, uh, Colin Simon and I started trying to breadboard together our own version um, more related to this Conqueror puddle, pedal. And, um, and then I actually bought uh, an amp, uh, an original Conqueror. And, um, you know, we're tracking down schematics and just building up prototypes. And we really spent like months and months messing around with that prototype. And we, you know, Colin's way more ahead of me electronically like on an engineering standpoint, but we would just take this breadboarded thing and just take every position of capacitor and resistor and, and switch them and then listen and record it and listen to the recording. And I couldn't tell you what we did, but I know we did some kind of uh, zany things that aren't technically correct. Mm. And um, there was something on the input or output where we put like a really weird value and it seemed to be like, dude, that's it right there. Yeah. And so we threw those into um, production and it, it took off like mad. Well, at that point, I was getting really good support from Reverb.com. There was a guy named Jim Turk who was like one of the head dudes there and he was into the Jack Celeste stuff that we were doing. So with, their, with them giving us extra support and um, finally being in a position where we could crank out 100 of these pedals every month, um, that thing took off like mad. Because I guess, you know, I found that one weird KR pedal, but nobody else was going to find one of those. And then the Magical Mystery pedal was what it was, and I think Castle Dine only makes like five pedals a month or something. So yeah. there was nothing like populating the marketplace and we really put the work in to to make it a unique pedal the white pedal is really different than anything else out there absolutely and like in using that thing where it's like you listen to the guitar solo on um happiness is a warm gun and like that was the solo where it's like okay this pedal has to sound like that and so when we got there we were like okay let's do it let's do it like this and we ended up doing a thousand of those before we uh, took our big break two or three years ago in total that exists a thousand that total yeah including version one yeah between between all versions we got right at a thousand now would you ever is a part out of supply or no we have all the parts we I, we could build a couple hundred more right now if we got the the cases made again part of the problem we're facing with remaking that one was we were drilling the holes in the pedals ourselves which was quite an operation and nobody enjoyed doing that and it was probably the hardest part of what we were doing was taking a big drill press and making forms so that the holes would be in the right spot and that is all kind of i think that drill press got thrown out to the garbage now so we don't have a drill press we would have to have somebody make that remake those and it's possible that we might be you know try to tackle that soon because with all the other parts we have hundreds of the parts left to make those we just don't have the cases right now um i I uh, have you ever heard of, of uh, a toot and snore in '74? No, toot and snore. Uh, okay, uh, uh, you know May Pang. Yeah. Uh, worked at Apple, and then uh, what's her name? Yoko was like, "Hey, John, let's take a break," mm -hmm. and she had it all planned because she's how she is. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, she set up a, a <laughs> who does this? She set up someone for for John to get with May Pang because yeah. she thought she wouldn't be a threat. Right. Meanwhile, May Peng turns out to be a total sweetheart, total, I guess you might say, team player uh, looking back because she ended up being, you know, with what happened. Yeah. Cool with it. But she got Paul and, and John, Harry Nielsen and Stevie Wonder 
to get together in I think New York City and they, they did it was called a Toot and Snore in seventy four. It's like a like a, a recording session together. Mm. Ringo and, and George heard about it and we're gonna catch a plane. One of them was like in Australia, some like very hard to get there in time country. Mm-hmm. And so one one was in New Orleans, I think one was in like New New Zealand or Australia. So one was like already almost there, and then when the other one was on his way, Yoko heard heard about it, ran back to John. Pa- this is true. Patched patched things up with him, and then they they were together till he died. Oh wow. Um, no, I I didn't catch that part of it. D- d- yeah, YouTube Toot and Snore in '74, Harry Nielsen. But uh, I think it'd be kind of funny to have a, a a a white pedal version three. And you have the Yoko Nav on the one side and the May Ping on the other. Oh, yeah, 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 <laughs> and, yeah. and have like a 1974 kind of, yeah, it. like some sort of effect. Like, cause like, what is it? Uh, Vox amps sometimes have tremolo, sometimes have reverb. So like something else that a Vox would have. So mm-hmm. so you're not like being too out there. Like that, that would maybe be on a Conquer or, or j- adjacent model of Vox amp. Sure. Or team up with Jack White. Because uh, he's been team up, teaming up with pedal companies, um, Death by Audio and some yeah, other I've ones. Yeah, seen a couple of those things. And uh, Triple Graph, and I think MXR. He just did this like that 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 two output yeah. pedal, which Duel looks actually very cool. Like yeah, uh, I want to try that because uh, you can get like two totally different tones, you know. Mm-hmm. But um, almost like a Rico sound, you know, like a Rickenbacker, a, a, du- a stereo output. Yeah, yeah. Uh, anyways. Um, Yes, uh, actually, I wanted to mention about the um, the dizzy tone. I didn't know that was the first one. And before I do that, mm-hmm. I think the unit drive was second. Nine standard Jextiles models. I, I, I've consulted your Jextiles Tumblr more than an old person consults the obituaries. I'm, I'm telling you. <laughs> I haven't you. visited that in three years. <laughs> and I, I must compliment your writing style and your choice of words. Oh, I, I, I like both um, to describe your works. I definitely overcooked the words. No, I was going to say uh, 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 compact and uh, complete uh, right. y- with your um, motivational, hopefully. Okay, nine, according to your, your, your um, what do you call it, uh, Tumblr, nine standard Jextiles models. Yeah. One, white pedal, discontinued February 2018. Two, range lord. Three, buzz tone. Four, and range lord gold. I'm not sure. Yeah, range lords were early on, actually. Uh, three, buzz tone. Four, unidrive. Five, canyon climber. Six, dizzy tone. Seven, jext face. Eight, jext fox. Nine, black drone wasp. Uh, are there mm-hmm. just nine, or, or is there a tenth or eleventh uh, jext to les, uh We did a couple jext rights. I never heard of that. It, it was our, our version of a fuzz right. Okay. Which is like the very early garage fuzz from the West Coast. But I, I don't think we made more than like uh, just maybe eight or ten of those, may, if, if even that. Man. Yeah, that was um, getting towards the end of our really good run, which was like 20. Things were really started hitting in 2017, and then by – 2019 early 2019 it was like okay bob needs a break (laughs) i was i was in a little bit of a rough shape and um well al needed his space where we were building so when he kind of gave us the boot in early 2019 rightfully so and then everything just went into like 40 boxes and ended up sitting around until just recently Hmm. but related to the pedals at the end like in late 2018 and early 2019 we were definitely starting to kind of add on a lot of different um um models because uh you know after you've established yourself as a success or or with a few models like the white pedal and our range lords were really popular and our unit drives were really popular and the dizzy tone was constantly popular then it's like you have enough wind at your back that you're like well we could sell a hundred of anything but it's not just like making anything to sell you want to make sure it falls into the brand and um so we're just trying to find other fuzz pedals that we had the motivation to build and I got a hold of a, f- of a fuzz face that was like one of the original 67 ones that was red and had the NKT275 transistors, and it sounded amazing. Um, I ended up selling that thing for like three grand. I, I still regret that. They're probably like 10 grand now. Woo! But 
that was enough motivation to go after it. And so we did the, the what is it, the Jext face? Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, those weren't as successful. You know, we might have made a couple errors in judgment there. It's like what's really happening now with the fuzz face market is people are trying to get a hold of those original NKT 275s or there's like eight different varieties or some silicon ones but if you can get a nice pair of those transistors then you get a round case and and there's probably like a dozen guys out there that are remaking fuzz faces and specializing in the strange old caps and the right potentiometers and stuff um we chose to make it into this huge elongated square box oh it looks small i didn't know it was huge yeah it's like this big oh wow that that the enclosure was intended to be like um a true bypass thing that had like four or five chan switch switch channels on it so we just took it and like turned it that way and, and tried to we were just trying to stick with like big huge old fuzz pedals that have like barely anything in them yeah but i don't think the marketplace found that as cute as i did so i think we only ended up making two or three hundred of those and and when at the time we made them like they started to sell but it didn't really take off that well yeah and that's probably related to I don't know maybe people were off put by this gigantic square enclosure but also the fuzz face guys are really purists and uh, we chose to use some um, RCA 2N404 for our germanium they are super expensive and hard to find and sounded amazing but if it's not an NKT 275 then people are more reluctant to to try that out but i think those pedals will have a nice um long life when people come across them i don't see them popping back out into the used market a lot mm. and um and the few guys like the guitar player from uh greta van fleet has one that he swears by for certain solos and i've gotten reports from people saying holy cow this is amazing and it should be i I really like burn myself out trying to voice every pedal on those. Yeah. Like I, I was not sleeping. I was staying up for days and days and trying to find the right pairs of germanium to give a quality that's really hard to describe. Mm. There's just a certain quality when you have that right fuzz face. Cause it's such a simple circuit and it's only two um, transistors and they have to, have some this kind of indescribable quality kind of like um what i describe as um rectification like in amplifiers there like a good rectification will will make it sound like a little eviler Ooh, that feels good i just put, I just put the heat thing on behind my neck That's i thought cool. i was talking about the sun <laughs> yeah 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 it's chilly out here yeah we'll, we'll take a break after this uh, little thing let, let you warm up uh yeah, yeah. Actually, I, I, we'll take a break right now. Uh, we'll take a break right now. Finish your thought in two seconds. Sure. So warm up for now. Me... Well, yeah. The fuzz face is really a crazy puddle. Okay, it, I'll be right back. Here, here. It's got, there's. It, it runs not after 20 minutes. Sure. You know, return to the scene of the crime, as it were, and try again. Because mm -hmm. there's this uh, street photographer named Marco, some Italian last name. He's, he's I hope he's alive still. In Easter Market, if you ever if you ever watch Easter Market, like for for decades, he he'd be, he'd be in like the furthest shed. He had a little stand set up selling prints of his photos. He he you know photographed heads of state, photographed you know all the famous people, all the crazy people, and amazing pictures in Detroit. So I'd always like talk his ear off, trying to get wisdom from him. Mm -hmm. Something he said over and over again was, uh, "You have a digital camera, right?" I'm like, "Yeah." He's like, just keep taking pictures. You have unlimited, basically. Yeah. I'm like, yeah. all right. And I, I, took, I took it and ran with it. Yeah. That's how I got started. I mean, I'm not even a photographer, but I got obsessed with that camera. Is there is there any similar thing with, with music? Or no, yeah, no, digital tape. Yeah, like, th this. No, because you, you can try again, try again, try again. You know, like there's oh, not yeah, like a yeah. limit. Right. Like, like a, 
Uh, but you, you that talk, does help. You talk before you don't get you don't rely too much on like Pro Tool or like like in the sense of getting lost in the menus, getting lost in like yeah. digitally changing things. Yeah. May, maybe for one one reason because how can you go back so easily and get that again? Yeah. You have to dive menu dive again just to get there, as opposed to twist a knob and you walk back the next day. It's still there unless someone else changed it. Yeah. Yeah, I mean. The technology that came with the DAW, you know, Pro Tools looking at a screen. D -d -d Digital audio workstation. Right, right. That definitely had many pitfalls, I, I'd call them, because you don't really achieve much by diving that deep into that stuff. One second. Uh, <laughs> you want a scarf? No, I'm good. Okay, okay. I got scarves in the car. No, it's good. Okay. I want you to suffer. No, I'm going to put some more hot tea in there. So, a as one does, I was listening to a bootleg audio recording of a jam session in 1971 between the recently late David Crosby and the Grateful Dead. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, a couple things from that. First, I think it was a recording engineer, or perhaps it was Jerry Garcia. Um, they take like a break after the first song and he's like, hey, uh, hey, excuse me, David, uh, would you mind turning down or t changing your volume on the amp instead of the guitar because it's something about it, it compresses the signal or something like that? Mm -hmm. David, if you change the level on it, don't change it at the guitar, change it at the amp because it'll change the compression. And I thought uh, I've got a Canon climber and then you also make, which one is it? Is it the unit drive or the buzz tone also has like a three, six and nine volt switch? Yeah. Um, is there anything to like? Is to the compression like what? What happens when you flip those switches to lower, or higher, or, like right down the middle power? Is what happens <laughs> to the sound? Um, yeah, definitely. Um, when you go down to three, you're not getting as much of the direct sound, so you're getting more of the affected sound, and that is sounds or feels like compression because. Oh. Distortion and fuzz is is compressing. It's like brick walling it. So when you go to six, you get more of the direct signal, and when you go to nine, you're getting like almost more direct than fuzz. And then with uh, the hipster and vanity uh, uh, switches on the uh, Canon climber, hipster being a little less and vanity being more, is it the same principle involved? Um, no, that oh. is actually adding a third transistor. Really? Yeah, Hipster is what? The original, um, very low volume. And that's what an original uh, Chine C companion, companion yeah. sounds like. It's very low volume. So uh, the, what's the other switch? Hipster uh, and, and Vanity. Vanity. Vanity, actually, we added a third transistor to just give you that big boost of gain. Yeah, because I'll, I'll play it and I'll, I'll do the other one. It's like so much it's louder. Definitely. Yeah. And different sound, yeah, like you said. Yeah, we used to put a uh, little write up in the pedals on those because we figured, man, people are going to think this thing's broken because it's like 30 dB difference. And, and I still get little reports where people are like, hey, I think there's something wrong with this pedal. And I'm like, nope, that's how it is. I don't know how you would use that hipster setting after you hear the other one. It's like that's volume will fool you that way every time. Like even a one dB of volume will fool people greatly on uh, even though the the lesser one dB down sounds way better equalized. When you give the human ear that one dB up, it just it it always wants the louder signal. That's so interesting. It, like that's the human ear, the human eye. Cause as a photographer that they, they talk about what, if you're looking at a scene picture, even, even if it's not a picture real life, the first thing you notice are perhaps writing. The second thing is like the lightest, well, you, your eyes drawn to the lightest thing, almost like the loudest thing. Mm -hmm. And then third would be at the human form. Or like kind of like writing the human form and the brightest are kind of like the three that vie for your attention. Yeah. But with, with sound, the loudest wins, the yeah. volume war, as they called it yeah. in radio. That's why doing A, Bs is really hard to be objective when you're doing an A, B test comparing two things because the one that is just slightly louder, even just imperceptibly louder, uh, always gets picked. Hmm. 
even if, you know, I don't know what it is, but it's really an A-B test is so imperfect because because of that, you know. In, in, in an infinite set of chances, all things are possible, and I suppose if, if history carries on long enough without uh, too much of a debilitating to uh, uh, world culture war happening, I suppose perhaps we'll, uh, the civilization will continue long enough for the volume wars to go in the opposite direction, perhaps to restore back to <laughs> healthier listening levels yeah. and actually give you a fuller, better sound. Cause yeah. It, yeah, I, it, it, that, I make, yeah. That's definitely huge. I mean, we're still suffering from that to some degree. In fact, it just became baked in that uh, records have to be as loud as they possibly can. Because, I mean, even though you can understand that it's tricking you, it's still human nature to choose it. Now, that's a question that you, I would assume that the, the board, $14,000 board from England you bought, BBC pr predated the volume wars, so perhaps it wasn't made to, maybe even modern boards, nothing, because that, that's not maybe how boards should be, because you're, you're clipping maybe sometimes to achieve that volume, yeah. but to, you're escaping that optimal sound. Mm -hmm. um, and I have nothing more to say on that. Well, <laughs> oh, no, oh, the, yeah. the super crazy loud volume comes from the brick wall limiting, uh, like the L2 limiter. And then other companies started coming out with their own little brick wall L2 limiter and calling it like the mastering plug-in or whatever. And and you can suddenly make your mix seem like it's 10 dB louder, but you're just c completely killing it. That's, yeah. You should try to stay away from that. But I mean, we all fell into that trap back in the day like you know mastering is always such a hard hurdle because you work on this record for a month or something and then it's like we have to have it mastered really you don't have to have it mastered, but everybody eventually gets to that place has to be mastered and then you don't know where to go who does mastering and um a lot of people these days are just going, oh, I'll just get this mastering plug in. And it, you, you shouldn't, <laughs> you really shouldn't because, because volume fools you so much that you will fool yourself into thinking you made it better and you didn't. Wise words, listen, listen folks at home. Yes, yes, yes. I was gonna say in that same 1971 recording, I should, I don't want to like give you homework, but the beginning of it, like, uh, I, Jer I, I'm assuming it's Jerry Garcia. He's using like a fuzz wah. I don't know if it's a, a, a fox fuzz wah, or I, I would assume, perhaps he's using a, a Lud Ludwig Phase Two synthesizer. Only a thousand were made. Of course, he owned two. Yeah. <laughs> and I heard Jerry Garcia and a couple other guys swore by it. Really? For, for, yeah, Jerry Garcia used a Lud Ludwig for for a while. Oh, jeez. No, I mean, and probably in the early like early days when it first came. Yeah, out, yeah, like, yeah. I I didn't find very much useful from that thing. Interesting. But, I mean, you could you could use it. There there it was kind of a bizarre box. So uh, there was nothing that was like um, earth shatteringly great in it, but it was just more. Like if you had to sound like UFOs were landing or something, it had enough crap in there to really fr make a, a tripped out sound. Of course, these days you could have all these true bypass pedals where you can blend. It, it might be cool to experiment with it just blended lightly into your signal. But yeah, I, I never found anything that redeeming about that. Big well, I, I love the form thing. factor of it. Cause do, 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 like, cause I, I imagine if you take, uh, this is, by a pipe dream pie in the sky yeah. but you take like the the guts for four because aren't there like four little foot pedals and a little expression yeah four, you, you imagine putting four juxtalize pedal activate and then like in a uh wah volume expression mm -hmm. and then have like a, the super jacks i don't know it's just mm -hmm. like like you could just cramp like the, the the pedal itself might not or the whatever you want to call it itself might not be cool but the the idea of how it could work, I, the ergonomics of it are kind of like interesting. It's like a workstation. I know th there are several pedals like that nowadays, though, like that have like a bunch of little things on it. Well, it's the pedal board, is that you know? You're right. Yeah. And that that I don't really obsess over the pedal board. It's uh, that's a very dangerous obsession. 
Uh, so you, you talked about uh, uh, three or four grand, you s three grand you sold your fuzz face for, now worth 10 grand. Yeah. You clearly love timeless tone. You match and exceed it in your own work. You achieved holy grail tones not just by using new old stock parts uh, and possibly consulting uh, schematics. You bought the real gear and were inspired by or emulated and made the true match to those treasured tones. Uh, so clearly there's a big place in your heart for these tones that you dedicated a portion of your life to making them yourself. Why is it then that you, why is it then that you sold some of your pedals that you used? Uh, I guess you, you regret it now. You, you, you'd keep them if you had the chance. Yeah, I mean, uh, there's so many of those examples Examples, because you, for me, like maybe I'm somewhat of a, a rare case, but maybe it's this way for almost everybody trying to get into this whole recording your own music thing. But when you get a new piece of gear, you, uh, you have like a window of inspiration where suddenly yes. you're writing a song, you're recording, you're doing all the things you think about that you want to do, and it all is driven by this new piece of gear. So and true. And then that wears off and you start feeling like you need another new piece of gear. And you're laying around, you're not doing anything two days later because that whole like uh, window of inspiration is worn off so i've definitely suffered from gearitis or whatever you call it yeah and still to this day like if i'm still buying gear and then when i get it i hopefully get like an afternoon of recording out of it before it just is another thing <laughs> reminds me of my my, my, my d d near dear friend lee a record store owner in detroit uh, uh for 25 years record store owner he um he bought the silver and brand new silver anniversary 25th anniversary Corvette, and he's a black man and very rare. People are looking at him, and, and, but but he 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 always tells the story over and over again. The first time he went drove it down Woodward, he's crying, and and and, and I'm like, why? Were you happy? Tears of joy. He's like, no, I was sad. I said, why? He's like, I finally got this car and I wasn't happy still. And so I, so I started crying. He's like he's like I've I've made it. So so far above where he thought he'd make it in life, and yet, you know, oh not satisfied. And he's like Ryan, never. He's like never forget that. Nothing will ever make. Nothing will ever be good enough. No, no objects. You know. That's like a movie scene. Oh no! So many stories of scenes of his life. I'm telling you. The guy's crying. He's yeah, in his silver. brand new Corvette. He actually still has uh, uh, that he got with it. Um, this limited edition, like that had every Corvette and. It, the, leading up to that one, like a little illustration, like thousand were made. He has all these like cool little things. Yeah. Speaking of gear, does he still have that vet? No, no, it's, it, uh, all of them were stolen. Oh man! And it's so funny. Now he's got a scooter. He's like, I'm done having cars. <laughs> uh, uh, he had like f three or four vets. So he. Oh wait, time check. Uh, let me restart the whole thing. I got a little more tea in the truck. 